If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to the uh, Old Testament book of Jeremiah. The Old Testament book of Jeremiah. And uh, find your way over to chapter 32, if you will. Uh, chapter number 32. Today will be my, uh, unless the Lord just really intervenes and changes my heart and direction for a while, I'll be my last uh, message on marriage and the family. I never started out to preach a series on the family, but as you know, God moved in some powerful ways over the last few weeks, and uh, uh, would to God only heaven will reveal how many Real marriages have been restored and renewed and salvaged in these last uh, five weeks. <clears throat> Today I want to talk to you around a very, uh, a very powerful thought, and that is that God can restore your marriage. Do you know um, 50% of uh, all marriages end in divorce in the last seven years? excuse me, in their first seven years, I said that wrong, 50% will wind up in divorce in their first seven years of marriage. As tough a statistic as that is, let me give you one that I think is probably worse. 65% of all marriages that don't go to the divorce courts say that they are living in a marriage that is stale, stagnant, and unfulfilled. That's heartbreaking to me. Um, I heard about a pastor who was uh, <clears throat> trying to minister to a recent widow in his congregation. And um, he went by her house and was sitting there helping her make the funeral arrangements. And uh, he said to her, said, he said, ma'am, um, one, one of the things that would help me in preparing for the funeral service if Maybe you could just tell me some of the last things that he talked about before he died. And uh, she looked back at him and she said, well, Pastor, you, you really want to know what the last thing that he said before he died? And he said, yeah, it would help me greatly when I get ready to do the funeral service. And she said, well, I, I don't mind telling you. He, she said, he, he looked me dead in the eye and he said, you don't scare me with that thing. You couldn't hit the broad side of a barn with that gun. <laughs> now that's a marriage that's in trouble, would you not say? Um, regardless <clears throat> of what position you're in life today, maybe you're a student, uh, you're part of that graduation exercise today. Uh, maybe you're single. Maybe you are single again. Uh, maybe you're in one of those 65% of those marriages that are stale and stagnant. Maybe you've already been divorced. I promise you, this message is for you. And there's something in this. I had a young single came up to me after the service, and, and God had really dealt with her, and she wrote down everything that God had dealt with her about in her relationship with him. And, and it was a, a powerful moment. It really was. So God has a word for you. Watch what verse 17 says. Jeremiah chapter 32 and verse number 17. Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm. And there is nothing too hard for thee. Look at verse 26. Then came the word of the Lord unto Jeremiah saying, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? You know that there's a lot of couples in this service today, just like there was at 8 o'clock, like there was at 9.30. There are a lot of couples that are sitting here this morning. Uh, their marriage was on the rocks, so to speak. Their marriage was decimated. Their marriage was lacerated and thrashed. Uh, their, their marriage was torn from limb to limb, if you will. And the world would have looked in and said to them in their relationship, you just need to throw in the towel. Uh, you don't have to live like this. 
Why don't you give up on this and go find somebody else that's going to make you more happy than they're making you? The flesh may have said something very similar that said, I'm in an impossible situation here. There's nothing that's going to help me. There is no way out. There's no hope. But I'm here to tell you as your pastor today, uh, God specializes in the impossible. And God moved mightily in their relationship. God moved mightily in their marriage. God moved mightily in them individually. And now it's greater than it's ever been before. I want you to know God's still on the throne. And what he did for those couples, he can do for yours as well. No matter how dark the situation may be, no matter how much the trust has been eroded out of your relationship, no matter how hard the pain that you are suffering this morning, no matter how difficult the situation and impossible that that situation may seem to you, God can restore your marriage. Amen? Maybe the zing has gone out. Maybe the spark has been smothered and the joy and the excitement and the freshness is gone out of your relationship, God can change it, but he needs your cooperation. God needs your cooperation. Now the fact of the matter is, Ken, God is sovereign and he can snap his fingers and he can will it to be done and every situation in your marriage that is giving you difficulty and grief at this point can be healed and restored. But he doesn't choose to work it like that. He could if he wanted to. But he chooses for us to be in part of the process that he has lined up for us to cooperate with to bring about a miracle in your marriage. Let me give you three or four of them if I could before we leave today. First of all, I want you to understand you have to thank and praise God for your spouse. Hey, and when's the last time you, you got your eyes off of everything that your spouse doesn't bring into the relationship and just went before God and began to thank him and praise him for your husband or thank him and praise him uh, for your wife? You know, Ephesians 5 and 1 Thessalonians 5 tells us time and time again that it doesn't matter what the situation or the circumstances we find our lives in, we are to praise him in and thank him for those situations. He's a sovereign God. So in spite of wives, in spite of his failings, in, in spite of his shortcomings, in spite of his inadequacies, when have you thanked God for him? Husbands, in spite of her weaknesses, in spite of her faults, in spite of her mood swings, when's the last time you thank God for your wife? How long has it been? You know, we have a tendency uh, as Christians to forget, even if maybe we didn't even know it, but we have a tendency to forget this wonderful principle that's laid out in the Word of God that praise releases the power of heaven into our lives. Let me just tell you how very simple that it can be. Are, are, are you listening? Let me tell you how simple that it can be. Psalms chapter 8. Uh, the Bible clearly says, From the lips of babies thou hast ordained praise to silence the foe. Now, now let, me, let me just make it real clear for you, Richard. What, what God just simply said there in the Word is that he has enabled the praise of little children to stop the enemy in his tracks. Now, we, we've talked about three or four weeks that your spouse is not your enemy, that you have a very sinister enemy that's trying to destroy you and your marriage and the Bible is plainly given to us this principle in the Word of God that if we just go before him and begin to praise him, he says, I will stop the enemy dead in his tracks that's seeking to destroy your marriage. Powerful principle. 
when Tony Green was still living and just before he died, he picked up the phone and called me and he said, Pastor, uh, you know that, that scripture that you preach a lot in revivals uh, about Jehoshaphat, can you, can you go over that with me again? And I, I think he was in, in Kentucky, he may have been in Tennessee, but obviously he was having some disturbing things going on in his life and, and he just, just wanted to know. I said, absolutely. I said, it's pretty simple, Tony. Uh, Jehoshaphat was the king of Israel and the enemy was coming in on him and there was about 150,000 of them that were about to be annihilated by the enemy and Jehoshaphat was just kind of wringing his hands not knowing what to do and so in the midst of his prayer he goes before the Lord and he says, Lord, we don't know what to do but our eyes are upon you. But then Jehoshaphat did something that is so remarkable. Instead of gathering up his finest soldiers and getting them battle ready, he got a group of them together and he formed a choir and they started praising God and giving God glory. And you know what happened? It released the power of heaven and God went to work on their behalf and annihilated the entire bunch of the enemy and Israel never even had to pull out their sword. Power and praise. I'll give you another example. One of my favorite books to preach from is Jonah. We preached through it about 10 years ago. I love the story of Jonah. You know, he went down to Tarshish. By the way, I bet he never used that travel agent again. And he gets down there and he gets into the belly of the fish and instead of focusing in on the acid that was burning his skin, instead of focusing in on the smell and the horrible circumstances that he found himself in, what he did do was he went before God and he just lifted his hands and he just started praising God and giving God glory and God sent a word to the fish and the fish vomited him out on dry ground. There's power in praise. I think about Paul and Silas when they were illegally arrested and thrown into that jail, rat infested, dark, cold, damp, horrible condition. They could have very easily said, wait a minute, God, what, what's fair about all of this? We've been out suffering for you. We, we've been out uh, preaching the gospel and planting churches and leading people to Jesus. And here we are now. In the, there's nothing fair about this, God. Where are you in the midst of all? Instead of that, what did they do? They just started lifting their hands and glorifying God and praising God and singing hallelujahs unto the Lord. And all of a sudden, God sent an earthquake into that place and rattled that place and shook that place. By the way, that's why wow, there's no good praise and worship music going on in Southern California right now. But anyway, <laughs> delivered them from that prison and before it was all said and done, the jailer and all of his household got saved. There's power in prayer. Praise, when, when is the last time, honestly now, that you got your eyes off of your marriage situation, off of everything that they don't bring to the table, and went before God and said, God, thank you for my husband. Thank you for my wife. When's the last time? Now, that, that's a powerful thing. In spite of their inadequacies and their faults, you praise the Lord and watch the restoration begin. Let me give you number two. You ready? Uh, this is another. I'm being a little bit re re redundant here, and it's very purposeful. Ask for and receive forgiveness. Now, let me help you here at this point. Some of you struggle in that area. Let me help you with this. If you're listening, shake your head like that. I'm listening. Before you can forgive, you've got to humble yourself. I want to tell you, I, I learned that. You, you, you got to humble yourself. We, we struggle. We, we, come on now, let's get real before God for a minute or two. We really struggle in that area, don't we? We, we really have a hard time uh, with that in our own life. But the Bible says in Philippians 2 and 3, count others better than yourselves. In Luke 14, Jesus said, humble yourselves and you'll be exalted. 
In James chapter 4 and verse 10, the Bible says, Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, and in due time he will raise you up. Couples need to humble themselves. You, you know what I've discovered, though? Here's what I've discovered. I've been doing this a long time. Here's what I've discovered. Women don't want to humble themselves before their husbands because they believe with all of their heart, if I humble myself now and, and show more vulnerability, the abuse is still going to continue to come and maybe get worse. And, and the husband says, I'm not going to humble myself before my wife because if I do that, that's just a gateway for her to continue to be what she's been doing. And what will everybody else think about me? They will think I am a wimp if I humble myself before her. And I'm losing control. Before you can forgive, you really have to humble yourself. Uh, Ephesians 4.32 says, forgive as God has forgiven you. I want to give you that same statement. I keep hammering it and hammering it. I'm going to continue to do it as long as God allows me to preach. You understand forgiveness releases the offender from the demand to pay you for the offense. Now some of you are in the room today have been greatly, greatly, greatly offended. And you're so angry, you're so mad, and, and you're demanding your pound of flesh, and, and, and you're afraid that if I give forgiveness, it's just going to promote more that I'm having to forgive. Hey, let me help you, friends. Listen, God says, vengeance is mine I will repay, saith the Lord. And I'm going to tell you, if you start putting yourself in the place where God says is his place, you're going to botch it. You're going to blow it. It won't work. Three reasons you need to learn to forgive. Number one, if you don't forgive, God's not going to forgive you. Just, I want everybody in the room to say that out loud. If I don't forgive, God's not going to forgive me. Pure and simple. Matthew chapter 6, you know what he says? Forgive us of our trespasses as in the same fashion, in the like manner, in the same way that I forgive everybody else. And what you're really saying there is, God, I want you to treat me the same way that I'm treating them. Forgive me the same way that I forgive them. I'm not forgiving them, so you're saying, God, I don't want you to forgive me. Number two, because we've been forgiven by God. I'll tell you what, when I'm tempted to hold bitterness and unforgiveness, when I'm tempted to not forgive, and all of a sudden, the Holy Ghost just shows me everything that he's forgiven me of. And I just crumble. I think, wow. Number three, I'm not sure this may not be as important as anything you're going to hear today. But Ephesians chapter 4 says this. If you don't forgive your spouse, it is opening up the window of your life and you're inviting the enemy to come in and to build a stronghold and a root of bitterness in your life. A beachhead, if you will, for him to operate out of your life. Number three, you need to focus in on your responsibility instead of your rights. Now that runs counterculture with everything that we've been taught Everything that we've been led to believe, because what we've been led to be, if you want to win, if you want to succeed, then you've got to assert yourself. You've got to be brave. You've got to be positive. You've got to take charge. But I listen, Ephesians 5 is the God book and the word of God for our marriage. And nowhere in any place in the Word of God are you ever going to find it written that you are to focus on your rights. But you are 
commanded to focus in on your responsibilities. Huge difference. Hey, men, listen to me. Do you remember that argument that you thought that you won last night? It ain't over yet. You know why? Because you failed to humble yourself and treat them the way that they should have been treated. Amen. That principle is saturated through the Word of God. Look at 1 Corinthians 10 and 23, the principle of the forfeiture of our rights. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 13 is another passage. I'll give you a good example. Do you remember Paul was writing and he said uh, that, uh, you know, I, I have a right to eat this meat, this meat that has been offered up to idols. There was a bunch of young Christians that didn't know any better that said to Paul, Paul, and to other Christians, you can't eat that meat that was offered up to idols. It's defiled. You can't do it. Paul said, wait a minute. I, I have a right to eat that meat. You guys just don't understand. You see, there's no such thing as an idol. The only one we worship is God. They're just making a huge mistake. And now they got this meat, and it's down there at the market, and it's marked down for 40% off, and I'm saving a ton of money, and I have a right to eat it. But if it's offensive to you, that bothers you, that tears you out of the frame a little bit, then I won't eat the meat. I have a right to eat that meat, but I have a greater responsibility that I don't cause you to stump and I don't mess you up. So we have rights in our relationship, but we don't focus in on our right. When you get married, you forfeit your rights and we focus in on our responsibilities. That's a more important principle. I do a little bit of premarital counseling. I always meet with a couple at least one time before we marry them. We got this whole system of things that we do for premarital counseling, but I insist on meeting with every couple at least one time. And I want to ask this question. I'll, I'll look at him and I'll say, hey, what do you expect in this marriage? What do you expect from her? And he'll say, well, Inevitably, just like every man, well, I expect her to meet my physical needs. That's every man. I expect her to keep a clean house. I expect her to cook and wash our clothes and raise our kids and encourage me along the way. Well, you turn to her and ask her, what do you expect? Well, I expect him to work hard and provide a good living and put a roof over our head and to keep us safe and protect us. And I expect him to be the, uh, uh, the, the leader in our home. I'll look at him and say, I'm not marrying either one of you. <laughs> and then when the shock wears off, their eyes get about that big and they think, what in the world? Because all of that stuff is good, you know. Those are the needs of a woman. Those are the needs of a man. Those are, you know, there. So what was wrong with the answer? You have to go into a relationship expecting nothing. Expecting nothing. Then when he doesn't do what he's supposed to do, and she doesn't do what she's supposed to do, then you're not going to get disappointed. They bring nothing to the table, then you don't get disappointed. No, no. Let, let me tell you what we, what we expect. Let me tell you what our right to expect. We have a right to expect our mate to stand still long enough for us to love them. Period. What's the point of that? What are you talking about, preacher? The point is that every marriage, you humble yourself and say, I am willing to forfeit the rights of my life for the sake and for the good of this marriage. Number four, and again, a little bit redundant here, but change your vocabulary. Change your vocabulary. Then you're going to get a fresh oil and anointing from God. Colossians 4 says, let your conversations always be full of grace. I like this next part. Seasoned with salt. 
palatable. Palatable, if you will. Now, there are four kinds of communication. Let me give you the help here. Number one is words of accuracy. Words of accuracy. Don't exaggerate in your relationship. Proverbs 13, 3 says, He who guards the lips guards his life. But if that person speaks irrationally or with great exaggeration, then he comes to ruin. Now, I'm going to drill down just a little bit and press down just a little further. How does that manifest itself? What does that look like in the confines of a marriage? I'll help you. You ready? It sounds something like this. You always leave the car in the driveway empty of gas. I always have to fill it up after you get through driving it. Or he says, you always spend more money than we have in the checkbook. She looks back at him. She says, you always leave the lid down. You never put it back down. All that stuff. Words of exaggeration. It's not always. It's not always never. The Bible says be careful uh, of that. Then words of truth. Just be honest and be truthful. Non-blaming words. Non-accusing words. Galatians 5.15 says, If you bite and devour one another, take care that you don't con get consumed. Hey, do you know when that happens more often and worse than any other time in our life? You ready for this? Sunday morning. You took too long to fix your hair. You do it every Sunday morning. You stand in front of that mirror and, and you're putting on all of that makeup and we're late. Every, it's 20 minutes after 11 and we're just now getting into the parking lot. Well, if you had to sit and watch ESPN and read the newspaper and the sports all morning long, we could have got here on time. And then miraculously, you pull into the parking space and there's this sharp uh, parking lot attendant that's outside, and the usher that's outside, and all of a sudden you open it. Well, good morning. Sorry we're late. We're going in. Thank God for parking lot conversions. <laughs> Amen. Had a couple came to see me some time ago. And they sat across from me, and I'll never forget this as long as I live. And you talk about beat up. She, she was just beat down. I, I said, well, t you guys tell me about it. She said, uh, Pastor, I can't do anything right. Everything I do is wrong. And, Pastor, he keeps a record of every mistake that I ever make. He had him a little book right in his lap. He had him a little book. You know what I want to tell people like that? Ma'am, just shoot him and tell God that he died. You know, the Bible says love keeps no record of wrongs. Use non-blaming, non-accusing words. Then words of gentleness, soft answer, turns away wrath. I'll give you the last one. That doesn't mean I'm done or we're going to go home. But um, practice biblical love toward your spouse. Let me, let me say it better. Practice biblical, biblical love toward your spouse. Not the Hollywood version, not the cultural version, certainly not the feminist version of love, but biblical love. 
I'm not going to do this as an entire sermon in and of itself, but 1 Corinthians 13 is that love chapter. And boy, if you just break it down and you look at it, you get a great definition of what it is. You know what? One of the things he says in 1 Corinthians 13, he says, love is patient. Love is patient. In other words, love puts up with a lot of junk and a lot of garbage. There's some of you men in, that, that's listening to this today. Before God, before God, there's some of you men that are in here. You need to be at the altar today and just stretch yourself out before God and thank God in heaven that your wife has put up with as much junk and garbage that she's had to put up with since you've been married. There's some of you women who need to do the same thing. Love is patient. Puts up with a lot. Some of you women ought to be here at the altar and just pouring your heart out to God. God, I'm grateful that I'm married to a man that's put up with me all during these mood swings and these ups and downs and ins and outs and all of the foolishness of my life. Love is kind, he says. Love's not harsh. Love doesn't envy. Can, can I just say that there's no room for jealousy in a marriage? None. Love is not rude. Love is not self-seeking. I've been preaching since 1973 been pastoring since 1976. I want to tell you what I believe with all of my heart is the number one reason for divorce. You ready? It's, it's not sexual improprieties. It's not financial pressure. I'm going to tell you what I believe is the number one cause of divorce in America. You ready? Self Self, self, self. Love is not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. Keeps no record of wrongs. I do this as a way of encouragement. I, I do it as a way of bringing glory to God. I, I do it as a way of giving people hope. And, and I'm convinced with all of my heart there are many husbands and wives in this room right now that need hope. If you'll remember the first week that I was with you, I shared with you how that 10 years into our marriage, um, we were an eyelash uh, from divorce. Pastoring my second church, I would not have given you a plug nickel for our relationship. But both of us humbled ourselves before each other. We began to seek God, not about our rights, but about our responsibilities. And God worked a huge miracle and enabled me to understand better today than I would have ever understood had I not been allowed to go through that. To empathize, sympathize, to love you more. To be a better pastor. If God did something similar to you in your marriage... Would you stand somewhere in the building if, if you were on the brink of disaster and God touched you and healed your marriage? Would, would y'all stand right now, would you? Don't you think 
that if God did that for us, that he could do it for you. He hadn't changed. He's still sovereign God. Is there anything too hard for me? No. Not even to the healing of your marriage. Would you stand? Father God, I want to intercede right now on behalf of <clears throat> every husband, every wife, every marriage that's in trouble here in this church. Lord, that maybe their lives, they're not going to divorce, but God, they're unfulfilled and flat and marginalized. God, I lift them up to you today. God, you can heal that. God, if we would just engage in this process with you, if we would just cooperate with you God I know that you could work a miracle Lord I don't know God how many homes that you've already restored and how many you've already renewed and how many God you've already turned around and heading in that direction in these last few weeks but God I know that you're not done I sense it in my spirit right now God that there, there's there's some people here God that they get it today they get it today